Good afternoon. Welcome to UCSF Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm Bob Wachter, Chair of the Department of Medicine. Uh, before we start our uh, COVID Grand Rounds today, just a quick plug for those of you interested in COVID. Obviously, you are. You wouldn't be here. Uh, on Friday, November 4th, we'll be doing a live stream, uh, virtual only conference COVID-19 update for clinicians with up to the minute advances run, as you see here, by number of my colleagues. I think it'll be a terrific conference. We've done this the last few years. And if folks want more info about COVID, this is a great place to go. Um, the usual grand rounds for today's conference, uh, closed chat captioning is available. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we will try to get to uh, a number of them toward the end. And as usual, uh, we will post this on YouTube uh, later tonight. And my colleague, uh, Lakshmi Santosh, is be, will be live tweeting this. Amazing, even <laughs> she's one of the speakers. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, for most people, particularly if you're vaccinated and boosted, the threat of hospitalization and death has plummeted since the early days of the pandemic. Uh, but we've, what we've come to learn painfully, and it fits and starts over the last couple of years, is there is another set of threats uh, under that goes under the, the uh, umbrella term long COVID uh, in the form of sometimes uh, prolonged, uh, sometimes disabling symptoms, uh, as well as potential long-term risks. Uh, that threat remains and has only grown in, uh, in amplitude over the last couple of years. I have to say my own thinking is highly influenced by that threat in terms of how careful I am uh, because of the concerns of long COVID uh, as opposed to the early days of the pandemic because when the concerns were mostly about the acute uh, threat of COVID. Uh, today we'll cover uh, what is known about this uh, really fascinating and troubling issue of long COVID with three nationally known experts, two from UCSF, uh, one from, uh, from Washington University and the St. Louis VA. Uh, so let me quickly introduce them to you. Uh, the first is well known to those of us at UCSF, Lakshmi Santosh is a pulmonary critical care physician at UCSF Health. She also is the founder and medical director of the multidisciplinary long COVID post ICU optimal clinic here established in 2020. Uh, the optimal clinic really was an early model of a long COVID a clinic and has uh, actually been highlighted in both professional and popular press. Uh, Lakshmi does many other things, including helping to run these grand rounds, uh, but she's a distinguished medical educator focused on clinical reasoning and transitions of care. So Lakshmi will start us off. Uh, next will be Michael Peluso, who's an infectious disease doc at uh, Zuckerberg San Francisco General. Uh, prior to COVID, his focus in his research career was on the chronic sequelae of HIV infection. And when COVID emerged, uh, he led the efforts to implement the long-term impact of infection with novel coronavirus, or LINK, two eyes, a study uh, which examined uh, the long-term impact of COVID. Uh, one of, and LINK is one of the most, uh, one of the first post-COVID uh, cohorts in the United States and now includes hundreds of individuals with and without long COVID, many of whom have been followed for more than two years. He's focusing not only on the epidemiology and outcomes of this group, but also on the underlying biological mechanisms. So, uh, Michael, thank you. He will, he will follow Lakshmi. And uh, third, uh, we're really privileged to have Ziad Al-Ali join us. Uh, Ziad is the chief of the Research and Development Service and director of the Clinical Epidemiology Center at the VA St. Louis Healthcare System, as well as a clinical epidemiologist at WashU St. Louis. Uh, he has conducted pioneering studies that have, that have demonstrated that each episode of COVID uh, may elevate the long-term risks of several of the major uh, killers and disablers that we have uh, in life. Um, he now serves on a number of important task forces, including the White House Interagency Policy Committee on Long COVID. Uh, he co-chaired the Biden administration's committee that developed the government's action plan on long COVID and serves on the federal government's long COVID coordination Council. He's had numerous publications, a number of high profile uh, journals regarding the long term impact of COVID. And I have to say, much of what I've learned about this um, has come from Ziad's work. So he's done a huge service to all of us in highlighting some of the uh, potential impacts of COVID. And we're thrilled that you could join us today and look forward to hearing your talk. Uh, the format uh, will be uh, Lakshmi first, um, Michael second, Ziad third. They're all going to give brief talks. Uh, designed to leave us with about 15 to 20 minutes of discussion at the very end. So with that, I will hand it off to Lakshmi. Thank you so much, Bob. 
for the kind introduction. So I will get us kicked off with unlocking the mysteries of long COVID. I don't have any disclosures. So this is our roadmap for the next about 20 minutes before we hand it over to Dr. Al-Ali. We're gonna talk about what is long COVID? What does that term actually mean? Who gets it? How are we currently treating it? And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Peluso to talk more about the why. What are the biological mechanisms why some people get this? But first, just a pause. You know, I still have this hard copy of the New York Times where we said 100,000 was an incalculable loss. And now where are we at? Just channeling my inner Dr. George Rutherford, COVID-19 is, is down, but still not out nationally. We've had over a million deaths. You can see our curves from San Francisco, as well as the New York Times tracker, which I still look at every day. And you see that although our slopes are trending down, we're hearing about an eighth wave in other parts of the world already eighth wave, hard to believe. And locally, our numbers are tracking this as well. We see that our local numbers are down. Today, our statistics show that we're in the yellow, 17 in critical care, 17 in adult care, and five in critical care. But as Dr. Wachter mentioned, why should we still avoid COVID? And the reason is this risk of long-term COVID, the long COVID risks that we're going to learn about in our hour today. So what does the term mean? So first and foremost, to center our patients and our patient community, this is a patient community generated term. This term, hashtag long COVID, was actually generated when Dr. Elisa Perego coined the term on Twitter. And the rest is history, as they say. We knew early on that this was a multi-organ system that affects multiple organ system, not just my favorite, the lungs, but also the GI tract, the cardiac system, the urinary system, the brain. And so it was no surprise that longer term outcomes also followed everything from long-term pulmonary fibrosis, clotting, myocarditis, neuromuscular issues, mental health impacts, and we'll hear more about that today. And a subset of people we noticed have this specific phenotype that has marked similarity and overlap with myalgic encephalitis or chronic fatigue symptoms. So these symptoms tend to wax and wane, they can fluctuate, they can relapse. There's a lot of post-exertional fatigue, paresthesias, and cognitive impairment or brain fog. And we know that our patients traverse multiple healthcare contexts. Some were so, so sick, but never came to the hospital. Some went to clinic, some were admitted, and some were critically ill. So it's a very heterogeneous group of very heterogeneous population that we're thinking about, and we have to disentangle all of these factors. So this seems like ancient history now. This was our first kind of long COVID study that came out of Italy, Carfi and colleagues, way back in JAMA in 2020, where we found lots of symptoms persisted months after COVID follow-up. And study after study has replicated this multi-organ system nature, looking at big data sets and looking at patient questionnaires that we'll hear about today. These symptoms of note are not limited to hospitalized patients. Newer studies are corroborating that these symptoms persist even in patients that were not hospitalized. We'll learn from Dr. Al-Ali about studies that even compare SARS-CoV-2 to influenza and note that this commonly can heard refrain it's just a flu really isn't true when it comes to the long-term outcomes. We'll also hear later from Dr. Peluso, again, replicating these findings in our large Bay Area cohort and tracking these symptoms longitudinally over time. What about those early weeks? In those early weeks, there's still a fair amount of acute inflammation. So the typical definition has been used to describe symptoms that persist after 12 weeks, as in the first couple of weeks there is um, acute inflammation going on. The other thing that's important to note is that symptoms do not necessarily correlate to organ dysfunction. You can have asymptomatic patients who still have long-term symptoms. You can have critically ill patients who have long-term symptoms, and you have patients who are super sick up front, but who end up being asymptomatic. What about the WHO F definition? Where are we at right now? So the WHO definition, I really like this one. They say that you need a history of probable or confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, usually about three months out, and not explained by an alternative diagnosis, importantly. They also note that symptoms can fluctuate or relapse over time, can wax and wane. One key thing to note is that there is no one long COVID. Each patient is unique. And there are some important symptom clusters that we're seeing from the big data, from the literature, from the cohorts. What are these main clusters? So big data analyses have showed that symptoms tend to cluster into a couple of different clusters, at least five. Some people have prominent dyspnea and cough, 
Some people have a lot of tachycardia. Some people have a lot of chest pain. Some people have back pain, joint pain. Some people have GI symptoms. And again, as I've mentioned before, there are a lot of patients who have symptoms that overlap with chronic fatigue or myalgic encephalitis, including prominent symptoms of post-exertional malaise, as well as dysautonomia or POTS. The other thing to know is that PASC, post-acute symptoms of coronavirus, is not necessarily equal to PICS, post-intensive care syndrome, because patients with long COVID are such a huge uh, population proportion, but the patients who are critically ill were just a small subset of those. But there are some key similarities and lessons we can learn. What about post-intensive care syndrome? This is, what is it exactly? This is a holistic approach to caregivers and patients. We need to think systematically about pulmonary issues, physical issues, cognitive issues, as well as mental health, and as well as think of the caregiver. So many long COVID clinics around the country, including ours, really operate on this foundation of post-intensive care syndrome clinics. Our clinic is one just like this, where we hybridize the post-intensive care and post-COVID holistic approach to look systematically at pulmonary symptoms, physical symptoms, cognitive symptoms, and neurological function. We partner really closely with Dr. Peluso's link studies and the comet studies and follow people longitudinally. However, we know that more resources are needed. Our patients who are hospitalized get to see us. We see a fair amount of patients who are non-hospitalized in our pulmonary clinic. And also we know that there's a huge proportion of patients being seen in primary care. What about our clinic? So we've seen over 880 patients so far in the optimal clinic. And we're part of a national organization called Cairo where, our, where we kind of pool our outcomes and our expertise and learn from the best nationally. Of that, we have about 500 plus new patients, 300 follow-ups. And what's our average time to actually seeing patients, what people wanna know, what's that lag time? It's about 44 days after hospitalization is when we get our first visit in. Our mean age and gender and racial demographics closely match that of our UCSF patient population with COVID. And what do we actually do in the clinic? So what we do is we follow a systematic structured template to listen deeply to patient symptoms and ask them about their pulmonary symptoms, their physical symptoms, their cognitive symptoms, their neurological symptoms. We do a very detailed evaluation with our clinic pharmacist who helps with prescribing and de-prescribing. De and we also have an optimal clinic specific physical therapist who really works on principles such as resting and pacing, thinking about pulmonary rehab principles, thinking about dysautonomic rehab principles, and we link patients to other care principles. We're kind of a hub and spoke model. So we work closely with cardiology, infectious disease, virtual support groups, and other places like that. And then one study I was about to share with you shows that actually attendance at our clinic was associated with fewer hospitalizations and ED visits. And so these findings actually persisted even after we adjusted for multiple risk factors. We published our findings in the journal CHEST as a roadmap for colleagues about how to actually start your own clinic. So we published this as kind of a roadmap of how you can start your own clinic without a lot of pre-existing resources. And we're closely modeled off of the Johns Hopkins crew. And if there's one slide that I really wanted you to see, especially for internists and generalists and trainees, this is the slide. This is an updated one page here by Dr. Trish Greenhaw and colleagues from the BMJ. And here's a QR code if you wanna access this resource by yourself and I'll also post it on Twitter. And this really talks about what you should be thinking about, what symptoms to ask about, what are kind of alarm signs, when to send to a specialist. And you'll see here that the treatments that they focus are really symptom driven treatments. And that's the state of where we're at now for, for treatments. We do a lot of differentialing in terms of ruling out other causes. And we think about how to manage symptoms aggressively, whether it's persistent dyspnea, are we looking for unmasking reactive airway disease, deconditioning, a steroid responsive process like organizing pneumonia, lung fibrosis, or the vascular complications of COVID, or other causes that can mimic that. We also provide our patients with resources about how to rest and pace themselves while also restoring movement to their life this is a booklet from Johns Hopkins that is free for anyone to access and look at if you or your loved one is recovering from long COVID. And then the other key thing that we do is remember that all that long hauls is not COVID. We have seen, Dr. Block and I have seen many, many diagnoses that are kind of long COVID mimics. 
We've seen sarcoidosis, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, metastatic lung cancer, postpartum psychosis, new pregnancy, new autoimmune disease such as ulcerative colitis. All of these can be COVID or long COVID mimics that we need to think about carefully. And then, you know, transitioning on to Dr. Peluso's talk here, until we elucidate the biology and have clinical trials, our treatments have been largely symptom driven. I just am strongly advocating that we need to move from the great science that Dr. Peluso, Dr. Alali and colleagues are working on into the clinical trial space so that we can offer more than aggressive symptom management to our patients. So thanks all for listening. And I'll transition now to Dr. Peluso and thank you. So hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here today to talk with you about the efforts that are going on at UCSF to understand long COVID. Here are my disclosures. Our research program is called LINK, which stands for Long-Term Impact of Infection with Novel Coronavirus. And it opened really in the very earliest days of the pandemic. Uh, it was initially started with support from people like Steve Deeks and Tim Henrich, and was tasked with uh, following people longitudinally after they had COVID and describing the immune response. What we quickly saw in LINK was that many of our study volunteers were coming to us and complaining of persistent symptoms in the weeks to months after they had COVID. And uh, we began with help from people like Jeff Martin and Dan Kelly to systematically catalog what our volunteers were telling us. And we ended up being one of the earliest long COVID studies in the world. LINK is a prospective study. We are following more than 700 participants performing longitudinal clinical phenotyping. We've collected and distributed tens of thousands of biospecimens to over 50 collaborators, and we have a couple of dozen publications so far. All of this was made possible by Becky Ho, who's our study manager, and I just want to acknowledge all of her amazing work. Link has provided a lot of early insight into the biology of long COVID. We began by describing the persistence and magnitude of the symptoms that our participants were telling us about. We then moved on to describing the humoral and cellular immune responses post COVID and their relationship with long COVID symptoms. We described persistent immune activation and inflammation in people with long COVID. We characterized autoimmune responses in people with long COVID and are continuing to work on that. We recently identified evidence of Epstein-Barr virus reactivation in our participants experiencing long COVID. We've identified some individuals who have evidence of microbial translocation, particularly fungal translocation into the blood. And we've described both viral persistence, inflammation, and um, neurologic injury in individuals with neurocognitive long COVID symptoms. But this is just a small part of all of the activities that are going on at UCSF and around the country. And so I'm gonna mention um, some of the other efforts at UCSF. This will certainly not be comprehensive, but I wanna give you an idea of, of how all of these things interrelate. So since the early days of the pandemic, we at LINK have been working very closely with the FIND COVID study, which is a CDC funded study led by Dan Kelly, focused on acute COVID virology. All of the participants from this cohort roll over into LINK and can be assessed for long COVID. And so we're looking at virologic and immunologic predictors of long COVID in collaboration with FIND COVID. Similarly, Sugi Lee runs a study called CHIRP, which is focused on early COVID immunology and we've been working closely with her to look at immunologic predictors of later term symptoms. Embedded within LINK is the cardiovascular impact study, which is led by Priscilla Shu and Matt Durstenfeld. And this study is performing really detailed cardiology measurements on LINK participants with and without long COVID. This includes echocardiograms, cardiac MRIs, cardiopulmonary exercise tests, and more recently tilt table tests. We've also been collaborating very closely with Joanna Helmuth at the Memory and Aging Center, who leads the Coronavirus Neurocognitive Study, which is performing detailed neuropsychological testing, lumbar punctures with cerebrospinal fluid collection and analysis in individuals with and without long COVID. There's an effort called Priority, led by Vanessa Jacoby and others at UCSF that is focused on long COVID in pregnant and postpartum women. And Tim Henrich, along with Henry Van Brocklin, runs the long COVID immunoimaging study, where we 
are, are doing um, advanced radiology measurements in link participants using a novel tracer to actually measure uh, immune cell trafficking and immune activity on a total body level in these individuals. There are also a number of efforts related to long COVID epidemiology. The INSPIRE study is a CDC funded project that is characterizing post COVID symptoms longitudinally and UCSF is one of the centers for that study. The COVID citizen science project started also in the early days of the pandemic and we at LINK have recently collaborated with this group to look at long COVID in their cohort. And then this fall, we're piloting a program called EpiPASC in collaboration with the local health departments with the goal of getting a population-based prevalence estimate of just how common long COVID is in the Bay Area counties. And then many of you have probably heard of the National Recover Program. Recover uh, really follows the local link model, but on a national scale. This is a nationwide research study funded by the NIH through NHLBI. UCSF is one of 15 institutions selected from among about 300 applicants. Uh, and this study performs really detailed clinical and biological measurements on hundreds of people. Um, we're looking to enroll about 900 individuals over the next year. Our study managers are Kamal Anglin and Beatrice Wong, who've done amazing work in getting this off the ground at UCSF. Uh, this program is highly synergistic with LINK and we've co-enrolled hundreds of individuals in both LINK and RECOVER. RECOVER also has separate pregnancy and pediatrics cohorts at UCSF, and there are major community engagement efforts associated with RECOVER, led by Kim Rhodes and Karina Marquez. So in the second half of my presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the potential mechanisms that could underlie long COVID. So this slide shows an individual with acute COVID um, who gets through the infection and either can recover fully or develop persistent symptoms characterized as long COVID. We know that there are certain risk factors for long COVID. So women tend to be more affected than men, people who are at middle age rather than the extremes of age, people with um, medical comorbidities, particularly diabetes and obesity, but certainly others, and individuals with lower socioeconomic status and who have less access to healthcare resources. But these are risk factors, that's not biology, that doesn't explain why uh, people actually develop long COVID. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the hypothesized mechanisms of why this might happen. These are listed here and I'll go through each of them on the next slide with the message that our collaborators are really exploring in depth all of these potential mechanisms. So the first potential mechanism is persistent COVID virus. At the beginning of the pandemic, we always said SARS-CoV-2 is a virus that comes and goes. It does not persist. There is no reservoir. Um, there is a growing body of evidence that is increasingly hard to ignore, suggesting that this may not be the case. We and Link described uh, about six months ago the identification of persistent viral proteins in individuals months after they had COVID um, in collaboration with Ed Getzel looking at exosomes in the plasma. And we've now launched a pretty robust um, tissue biopsy program with Ma Samsak, uh, Tim Henrich, and others to look for virus in gut tissue. We're also collaborating with David Walt at the Reagan Institute to see if we can measure spike in blood. As I mentioned before, early in the pandemic, we identified in collaboration with John Winslow at Monogram that many of our participants with long COVID had elevated levels of systemic inflammation. So we're now doing a deeper dive into understanding this in collaboration with people like Nadia Rohn, Satish Pillai, Irene Soretti at the NIH and others to better characterize this inflammation over time and figure out what is driving it. Recently, Tim Henrich, Peter Hunt and I described that uh, people in link with evidence of EBV, Epstein-Barr virus reactivation had a higher likelihood of reporting post-COVID fatigue and post-COVID neurocognitive symptoms at four months. And so we're trying to explore this further with a focus on tissue and then working in collaboration with people like Matt Spinelli and Annie Antar, who's at Johns Hopkins. We've been looking at long COVID in our population of individuals living with HIV infection. With Mohammed Abdel Mohsen at the Wistar Institute and Alan Lande at Rush, we've described microbial translocation and are investigating changes in the host microbiome in individuals with long COVID. And then there's been a lot of attention recently on microvascular dysfunction and clotting dysregulation. 
So our cardiologists, Priscilla Shu and Matt Durstenfeld are very interested in this. We're collaborating with uh, Shabani Patti and more recently with uh, Reja Pretorius at Stellenbosch University in South Africa to try to explore these issues. And then finally, the balance or imbalance of the productive immune response versus the autoimmune response. Uh, and so we're conducting a big project right now in collaboration with Aaron Badansky from Joe DeRisi's group to see whether we can identify signatures of autoimmunity in people with long COVID. This is not a comprehensive list. There are many other activities at the university, both clinical and research-based um, at all of our campuses and all of our departments and in all of our divisions. So looking toward the future, uh, clinical trials are on the horizon. As Dr. Santosh mentioned, uh, we really need proven treatments. Most long COVID therapies right now are focused exclusively on symptom management, which is good, but um, hopefully will not be the final answer to this. And there is, especially over the last six months, a, a real expanding focus on treatment of the potential mechanisms that I just described. Some of those proposed treatments are listed on this slide um, in this table. Um, and I think what I want to convey is that finally, investigator initiated network and nonprofit funded studies are beginning to start now. So in conclusion, there are many efforts at UCSF around long COVID pathophysiology. I think that this is gonna be a national priority for at least the next decade. Uh, I hope that we will begin to figure this out sooner than that. I really believe that research programs that are rooted in clinical programs are going to be essential to figuring this out. This was the model that we followed for HIV research 20 years ago that was hugely successful. Um, and I think that we're hoping to replicate that uh, with our long COVID programs. While the mechanisms are still unknown, there are several targetable pathways that have been identified and proof of concept interventional studies are really gonna be needed to define these mechanisms. Drug development is still in the early stages and most studies so far are investigator initiated and taking place in settings like ours. Unfortunately, industry engagement thus far has been pretty limited, but we hope that that will change over the next year. And many people are really desperate for a treatment and they are using off-label approaches. And I think that for me, that really emphasizes the need to rigorously and quickly conduct studies that will allow us to identify treatments that can get patients the relief that they need and deserve. So I'm gonna end by acknowledging um, our amazing study team and we'll be happy to take questions during the Q&A. Thanks so much. Thank you to both of you, terrific talks. I have 100 questions, but I'm going to uh, restrain myself and wait until uh, Ziad is done because some of them sort of interface with his talk as well. So let's go ahead and hand it off to uh, Ziad. Thank you for joining us and look forward to hearing your presentation. Well, thank you for having me. So uh, I'd like to provide you today with a bit of a, an overview, a very brief overview, a 15 minute overview of what, what our thinking and our, our uh, you know, studies on, on long COVID. In terms of disclosures, I've consulted for Gilead and Tonics in the past year. Um, I am employed by the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, and the opinions expressed here are solely my own. And we've re received funding for this work from the VA and also the American Society of Nephrology. So what, 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 sort of what got us to long COVID? Like, how did we, a bunch of clinical epidemiologists here at the St. Louis VA, sort of start thinking about long COVID? And, and, and that really goes back to the beginning of the pandemic when we asked the question as a team of researchers here, what do we do or how do we do our part in helping address the challenges of the pandemic? And that was in March 2020. And, and really, we resolved as a group right there and then to identify important questions to the nation, you know, really, really important questions that the people care about and try to solve them or address them using scientific approaches or our scientific method. And at that time, we really did not know anything about long COVID. Long COVID was not in a national conversation. Long COVID was not on our brain. And we started receiving reports. And, and what I call here is the index case. The index case for long COVID was not a, a case report in the New England Journal of Medicine or a report in Nature or Science or anywhere else. It really was in the form of an op-ed piece by the amazing, amazing Fiona Lowenstein in the New York Times when she was saying, we need to talk about what coronavirus recoveries look like. And mind you, that was in April 2020. At the time, everybody was telling us that SARS-CoV-2 is an acute infection, especially if you're young and healthy previously, you got SARS-CoV-2 infection, you may get sick for a day or two or three or four or a week or two, and you get over the hump and you fully, fully recover afterwards. She was basically saying to us and telling us that 
That's not my experience. I was young and healthy. I did not have any medical problems. I got COVID-19. And weeks after that, I'm still having trouble with breathing, cough, memory problems, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that was really, if you can think about it, this is really the index case. This is really the first case report in the form of an op-ed piece in New York Times of what, what now we call long COVID. And to her credit and to the credit of the patient community, you know, they really coalesced around her. Her op at peace made quite a bit of a buzz. And, and really, a lot of the people who share similar experiences you know, started gathering together and formed what we now call the patient-led research collaborative. And this is really a very formidable moment in the patient movement that they really identify, were able to identify their shared common stories, their stories among them, themselves. That sort of a, you know, they were having all these problems and they and, and then they resonated with the up at piece of Fiona Lowenstein and formed this group. And they started cataloging, you know, or they did a survey of their membership and started cataloging, you know, the breadth of problems they were experiencing. Mind you, this was not a controlled experiment. There was no control group here. There was really a survey of their membership, mostly young and healthy people previously who got COVID-19 and they were reporting weakness, fatigue, brain fog, muscle pain, and multiple other manifestations back in May of 2020. They started referring to themselves as long haulers. And as, as mentioned earlier in the talk, you know, the term long COVID was coined. And really this is a beautiful moment in, in, the, in the annals of medicine, in the history of medicine where you know, patients really identified the problem first before any of us really even start thinking about it deeply, you know, characterized the full breadth of symptomatology, gave it its name and really excited us or really led us to really sort of a, you know, start being interested in this and, and thinking deeply about it and, and, and wanting to research it. So right there and then we sort of started thinking in my group, like, so what are these people talking about? This was an uncontrolled experiment. So there's no control group. There's no way to really, you know, really deeply understand whether those things, you know, the, 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 the breadth of manifestations that these patients were describing is actually due to SARS-CoV-2 infection. So we really asked a simple question back then. What is long COVID? What are these people talking about? And, and we, we resolved to address it using our, our data. And, and we took what we call an unbiased approach, a high dimensional unbiased approach to characterize the post-acute sequela of SARS-CoV-2 or the post-acute sequela of, of, of COVID-19. And what we've observed that, that really you, people can get sequela in multiple organ systems, including mental health problems, nervous system disorders, metabolic manifestations, GI problems, skin disorders, now really abundantly coagulation problems in the form of blood clots, microclots, or DVT and, and, and PEs, a breath of cardiovascular manifestations, respiratory problems, of course, you know, shortness of breath, cough, et cetera, et cetera, lingering shortness of breath and cough beyond the acute phase, kidney problems, musculoskeletal problems, and really, you know, what we can as general problems like malaise, fatigue, and, 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 and other disorders. And what we wanted to sort of try to un understand whether how does this really compare vis-a-vis -vis another well-characterized respiratory viral illness called seasonal influenza or the flu. So what we observed here in this analysis that the magnitude of risk with COVID-19 was always higher than seasonal influenza. Seasonal influenza and some people with the flu can actually go on to have lingering manifestations, lingering shortness of breath, cough, maybe even fatigue for weeks on end or even months on end. But the risk was much higher with, with COVID-19 than seasonal influenza. And number two, and very important distinction, is that the breadth of organ dysfunction, the breadth of organ manifestations, is much more extensive in COVID-19 versus seasonal influenza. So right there and then we sort of sort of uh, you know start thinking that this is really a different kind of post-viral syndrome or post-viral illness. We've also observed that the risk was evident among non-hospitalized. And that's really very important because, you know, that's really, this group represents the majority of people with COVID-19 in the world, in the US, and, and certainly in the world. Most people with COVID-19 are either asymptomatic or mildly, mildly symptomatic. They nurse it at home, they may get sick for a day or two or three or a week or two, get better, and, and, and then, you know, subsequently, some of them may, may, may have, you know, post-acute sequela. The risk, of, the risk was also increased, was much higher in people who were hospitalized and highest in people who needed ICU care in the acute phase. So the risk increases according to the severity of the acute infection. 
And if you look at this slide, it's like, oh my God, Ziad is showing us all this heat map. It's, it's really, it's really all over the place. There's a lot of redness all over the place. We can't make, you know, it, it's 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 a mess. You got the right conclusion here. So this is really characterization of post-acute sequel of SARS-CoV-2 by age, race, sex, and based on health status. And, and, and I think what I want you to get from here is, is long COVID is not one thing, is a lot of things, and it's not monolithic. If you don't see a specific pattern here, you absolutely arrive at the right conclusion. It's a non-monolithic entity. It's not one thing, and that does not behave in the same direction according to age rate, or the sequela, different sequela are not expressed in the same direction, or the risk is not expressed in the same direction according to age, race, sex, and baseline health status. It's truly a non-monolithic disease. So we, we then also resolved to try to sort of gain a deeper understanding of the sequela of concern, you know, cardiometabolic risks, cardiovascular disorders, diabetes, kidney disease, and also neurologic disorders. Here are our attempt to deep, do a deeper dive into cardiovascular manifestations of, of, um, of SARS-CoV-2 infection or COVID-19 a year after the initial infection, we observed increased risk of a variety of cardiovascular problems, including you know, strokes, dysrhythmias, you know, arrhythmias of the heart, inflammatory heart disorders, ischemic heart disease, and thrombotic disorders. We've also done, done a bit of work to try to you know, uh, understand whether the, the metabolic risks after, after a SARS-CoV-2 infection there was a lot of talk about the new onset diabetes, so we decided to take a deeper look here and, and, um, and, and, a, and a cohort assembled using two major controls followed for at least a year. And a clearly increased risk of diabetes that was evident even among those people who did not need hospitalization for COVID-19, even among those people who did not have a disease that was severe enough to put them in the hospital or severe enough to, to put them in an ICU. And we've characterized the risk of kidney dysfunction. And if you look at the EGFR trajectories here or estimated glomerular filtration rate trajectory over the course of a year, you know, people with SARS-CoV-2 infection versus the control group have a, a much steeper decline of DFR. And that to quantitative here is about two to three milliliter per minute per year. That's really the equivalent of their kidneys aging two to three years in the span of just one. So you can start thinking about SARS-CoV-2 infection as almost as a, an accelerant of aging, as a, as a sort of like a, it ages you in the span of one year, you know, these kidneys age two to three years in the span of just one. And this is really remarkable. Now, luckily here, if you really see that the, much of the decline in EGFR trajectory happened in the first 200 days, and the ensuing days is sort of kind of plateau. So we're hoping when we do our two year studies that really the risk plateaus over time, that really the hit is really initial. And in the first you know, six months or so, you know, that is this decline, that is this accelerated aging and it sort of plateau, peters out and, and, and plateaus afterwards. This is what's looking like here, but this is really pending confirmation of a longer term study you know, by, by, our, by Charlie and, and, and my team. Um, and also we've done here a characterization of the long-term neurologic disorders of, of, of people with COVID-19. We've, we've all heard about brain fog, that people with SARS-CoV-2 or people with long COVID have a neurocognitive or cognitive impairment, or, or people, people refer to this as colloquially as, as, as brain fog. But it's really much more extensive than that. You know, people, people can have strokes, uh, obviously cogn cognition and memory disorders, episodic disorders in the form of headaches, seizures, and epilepsy extra pyramidal disorders, uh, mental health problems, including depression, anxiety, PTSD, and, and sleep disorders, musculoskeletal skeletal disorders, sensory disorders, we all heard about tinnitus and bringing in the ear and, and, and um, you know, taste problems and, and, and smell problems that can persist. So clearly sensitive uh, sensory disorders there. And, and we, so we, and, and the risk here is also importantly is, is expressed or is clear and evident even among non hospitalized, even among the people who really are not hospitalized for, with the disease. So th this is really one slide to sort of, a, you know, show us do vaccinations work? Do vaccinations well? I told you about long COVID. You know, you've been probably in your brain is like, okay, well, I'm vaccinated and maybe boosted. Good, good. That's, we want that. That's, that's wonderful. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Do how how much you know what's the effect of vaccination on on long COVID and and 
and our result, different result, different studies have different results. And in and, and our in our work and and our data, we see a risk reduction, but not much. So vaccines reduce, but do not completely eliminate. Actually, minimally reduce, but overall by only fifteen percent in the study but do not eliminate the risk of long COVID. The risk reduction is variable according to organ system. Most of risk reduction happens in the pulmonary space and the pulmonary organs, and also in coagulating the, the, the clotting, the, the, the DVT and, 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 uh, and, and, and clotting disorders. So I cannot really give this talk, although it's a, only a 15 minute without sort of mentioning that when we talk about long COVID, it's really an umbrella term for a lot of things. It's unlikely to be, when we sort of deeply understand it over the years, it's unlikely to be one thing. It's most likely multiple different clusters of, of diseases. Now we all sort of lump under this umbrella term. There's quite a bit of overlap with post-hospitalization, but as mentioned by Lakshmi, absolutely wonderful slide. There's overlap, but not complete overlap with you know, post-ICU syndrome or post-hospitalization syndrome. And obviously, I just told you, it happens in people who were never hospitalized. So, so But there is some overlap, and, and I think that that's really also important to, to mention here. There are a lot of similarities and distinctions between you know, what we now call long COVID and other post-viral illness, the post-flu, you know, post-measles. Now we know EBV can result in long-term manifestations in the form of multiple sclerosis, post-Ebola syndrome, and post-polio syndrome. There's also quite a bit of an overlap with MECFS, or chronic fatigue syndrome. And I think this is really important because unlocking the mysteries, you know, the title of this grand round of, of long COVID can really help us understand these diseases better, and two, can help us prepare for the next pandemic much, much better. You know, it's almost a certainty in life that we're going to have a next pandemic. It just, we don't know if it's going to be in a 10 year or a hundred years, but, but, but certainly understanding the post-viral condition now will pay dividends, not only for helping us understand and help these patients now and understand other post-viral diseases now, but also prepare for the future. So what are the implications for health systems? We, we think that the burden of long COVID in the U.S. is around four to seven percent. That's really on the lower lower end of the, the estimate spectrum, but those are our studies, and this is what we sort of think is anywhere between four and seven percent in the U.S. Long COVID is a multifaceted disease. It's not one thing. It's non-monolithic multifaceted disease that can affect nearly every organ system. So we think long COVID can also affect multiple organ systems and may result in, in rise in the burden of chronic diseases, specifically cardiovascular disease, diabetes, kidney disease, and maybe neurologic disorders. Best way to prevent long COVID is to prevent COVID in the first place. So if you haven't gotten infected, you haven't had a primary infection, I think you know, doing your best to try to prevent that infection is really, is really the best thing you can do for yourself or preventing reinfection. Um, I cannot also give, give this talk without sort of talking about misinformation, disinformation, and gaslighting. We have a role as a medical community to actively combat misinformation, disinformation, and, and, and gas gaslighting. Actually, some of it is medical gaslighting. I started this talk by really illustrating the beautiful example of how patients really illuminated our understanding or actually fed our awareness that this thing existed, that long COVID existed, gave it its name and called attention to it. And this is really a remarkable, remarkable point or moment in the history of medicine. I think it will be you know, remembered as really an inflection point in our trajectory of how we really galvanized the interest around long COVID and galvanized all, all of us to sort of really study long COVID. So the power of patient advocacy cannot, cannot be, I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, again, well, when we started this talk by, by introduction by, by Dr. Wachter, you know, saying that we all pay attention to cases and hospitalization, but that's really not the whole thing. That's absolutely correct. That's really only, in our view, that's only the tip of the iceberg. Long COVID is what lies beneath, and, and that's a lot of disease and disability. We worry a lot about long COVID in kids, leading to development and educational attainment problems. Long COVID will likely affect or put a dent in life expectancy, you know, which is really going in the wrong direction now in the U.S., and, and, and it's really a tragedy on its own. We have significant economic implications. The early indications now that we're getting from the Census Bureau, from the you know, from the uh, from think tanks, and then are really substantial effects on the economy and the labor market, and, and that cannot really be ignored. And we think we certainly have societal implications. So, I wanted to summarize here: long COVID is a multifaceted disease, can affect nearly every organ system. We put the burden out there on about four to seven percent 
You know, government and health systems you know, must adapt quickly to establish post-care strategies. I'm grateful to my team here for, for doing all this really amazing work. And, um, you know, thank you. And we'll, we'll do question Q&A with, with Dr. Wachter. Um, do we need a, a new name for this? I find when I say long COVID, people immediately, what brings to mind is you feel crummy six months from now, not that I'm an increased risk of diabetes or kidney disease or heart disease. So do you think the name captures this long-term risk of chronic disease yet, or do we need a different way of framing this? I think there's a lot of back and forth between us and CDC and NIH and like how, how do we best name it and some people gravitate to PASC or post-acute sequel of SARS-CoV-2 or post-COVID condition like the CDC wants to call it WHO has a sort of a, a sort of a, everyone has their own you know sort of a way of, but I, I think I like the term long COVID and I think we, if we educate you know all of us the community of scientists and medical professionals and also the public what long COVID is I, I think sticking with the name that was really on, originally coined by the patient community I think and, and honoring them and sort of a you know they they they, they actually alerted us. I, I I would not be able to do any of this research had it not been for their inspiration, you know, to and pointing mm -hmm. us in the right direction. Study this. This is really important. We are hurting. We need somebody on our side to really help us understand this. So I, I'm sticking with long COVID, and I think it, it's very important to help help sort of a, a educate the world that that long COVID is now one thing, and it can also involve organ dysfunction. Yeah. Um, okay. And I've heard the risk factors characterized as being comparable to, for example, smoking, like your increased risk of an MI or of a stroke is comparable to smoking or untreated hypertension. Or is, can you give us any of those sort of comparabilities with risk factors that we're used to thinking about? So in terms of like, you know, characterizing as a risk factor, I think we, talk, we definitely agree. Well, whether the, so the, how do we place it vis-a-vis -vis smoking and hypertension, whether it's really a stronger risk factor or a much more weaker risk factor, I don't think we can answer that. I don't think we have the data now, the science to really back it up. But it's very clear, you know, from our studies and also a bunch of others, like really reproduced really wonderfully by a lot of groups in Israel and Europe and in multiple other, in, in the US and, and elsewhere as well, um, we, we really clearly see that that COVID is a risk factor for these non-communicable diseases, hypertension, uh, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, and neurologic dysfunction. I think um, the, the question is like, how do we how do we place it? Is it really a more profound and more consequential risk factor than hypertension or hyperlipidemia? I, I don't I don't think I can answer that at this point. Okay, and one thing I, I don't I'll turn to our other speakers in a second, but you made the point that the the risk of, for example, MI or the other long-term non-communicable risks is somewhat associated with the severity of your initial infection. I didn't hear whether it's associated with the, the whether you have symptomatic long COVID. In other words, do we know for sure if you are symptom-free at two or three or four months, does that lower the probability you're going to have a long-term sequelae or that's inconsequential? So th this is not clear from our studies, but from other studies, we, we know that asymptomatic individuals can also develop long COVID. So that's very, very clear. And, and we, we think generally that the risk might be lower, although I cannot like point to a study of ours like asymptomatic versus symptomatic. We haven't really done that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's clear to sort of a graded association between the severity from like asymptomatic all the way to really in the ICU. There's this really graded association between severity of the infection from asymptomatic all the way to severe and, and the risk of post-acute sequel of SARS-CoV-2. Okay. Uh, I don't know if either of you want to make any comments on any of the questions so far. Uh, otherwise, I'll turn to you with specific ones. Anything you want to add? No? Okay. I would just uh, say that there is something to be said for this dose response effect, right, that Dr. Al Ali is talking about. So when, you know, one of the questions posed was, is it worth kind of trying to avoid COVID forever? I think when you think about public health policy and strategy, there are things that we can do to lower the kind of collective viral load, because there are studies showing that kind of implications of viral load, dose response effects, severity of illness does affect long COVID risk. So when you think about the public health implications, I do think the dose response does matter. Well, let's get to that. So, so, you know, you hear a lot of people who say, I've been trying to dodge this for two years and I finally got it and I felt crummy, but then I felt relieved because at least I get it out of the way. And what I tell them, I will tell me if I'm right, is I wish that were true, but your second case adds to your risk, both of symptomatic long COVID and maybe, Ziad, I don't know, your risk of long-term outcomes. So maybe either Michael or, or, or Lakshmi, sort of let's start with the symptomatic point, it, it, your chance of 
having symptoms several months out, how has that changed for your second or your third infection versus your first? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, there, there are so many different factors and we're kind of in the sixth or seventh era of COVID now. So layering on different variants, variant specific risk, uh, vaccines, multiple boosters. Uh, so it's, I think it's really hard to compare apples to apples. I mm -hmm. think the, the point that's important that I think you made is I'm still trying to avoid getting COVID um, uh, because um, that is the, the, the best way that you could avoid getting long COVID is to either not get COVID or have fewer COVID infections, presumably. And then, and then if you had COVID before, other than the immunologic effect of whatever protection that grants you, do you feel like your risk of long COVID is any different for your second infection than it would have been for your first, based on what we know? I'd be curious what Ziad has to say. I mean, I can say we've started now in our cohort to see people who we knew after their first COVID infection who are now getting a second or third. And so I don't have answers to that yet, um, but it's definitely something that we're looking into. Anecdotally, do they get worse? Does their long COVID get worse after their- Some people, some people I know have gotten, have, did not have long COVID after a first infection and subsequently got it. Other people I know did have it after a first infection got reinfected, were really worried about it, and their symptoms did not get any worse, or in some cases, you know, maybe even improved. So it's it's really hard to tell. Got it. Ziad, any comments on that? So we studied the risk of reinfection. That was in a preprint now, and have, fortunately has been accepted in one of the journals that will be coming out in mid-November. Um, the, the second infection really matters. So, so for people who really have a first infection, if they're asking the question, does protecting myself from a second infection really reduce my risk of long-term problems? And the answer in our view, in our data, absolutely yes. So it really matters to protect yourself from a second infection. And mm -hmm. the reason this because we started seeing patients in the clinic with this air of invincibility about them that oh hey doc i'm had previous i'm vaccinated i'm boosted and I had infection so i had both vaccine derived immunity and natural immunity from infection so they had like this invincibility about them that oh you know if i get the virus a second time like i've had it one time so i have this immunity i'm, I'm, I'm vaccinated and it, and, it, and it may actually make it milder than acute phase, but absolutely the risk is additive. It certainly adds or contributes additional risks in, in, in the second and third infection. Got it. Um, Lakshmi, I think Ziad hinted at this, the, the economic toll and the toll in the healthcare system could be enormous. You've put together a COVID clinic uh, or post-COVID clinic. Um, are, is there any special funding for that from the government to support such a thing? Because in the normal world, sort of creating a primary care-ish clinic for people that have very complex illnesses and, and, and need uh, probably longer, longer uh, sessions would not pay off economically and there would not be an incentive to create such things. And it sounds like we need a lot of such things. So where does this live economically? It's a great question, Bob. So one day when I was frustrated about exactly this, I, I took my rant to paper and wrote a piece called Beyond in the Red, making a business case for a long COVID clinic, which is published in the annals of the ATS. Because look, talking to colleagues around the country, we're all wrestling with this. There's no dedicated government funding for long COVID clinics. There are no COVID centers of excellence that are designated either. So there, there are some hotel resorts that shall not be named where you can go and get a long COVID cocktail in the lobby of, um, you know, questionable IV placebos. And so it's very worrisome that in the absence of quality control, dedicated funding, dedicated centers of excellence, misinformation, as was mentioned, kind of can proliferate and snake oil salesmen and women can pro proliferate in this vacuum. So there is no dedicated funding. And yet what we need desperately is more funding. Um, every single day I review, review referrals for patients where they can't come to our clinic because of the referral criteria, because our team is so, so small and underfunded. And I wish we could expand it to see more patients. And I work with their primary care teams to say, hey, here's some research that suggest, try these trials, enroll in LINK try these rehab strategies. And so we need funding of a much larger scale and clinical trials to really move the needle for our patients in need. Great. Michael, you made the point that this could be six different pathophysiologies, uh, after which my head was spinning. How important is it that we're going to sort that out as opposed to just try 
Paxlovid and a whole bunch of people and see if it works. Try an immunosuppressive and a bunch of people see if it works, and then it sort of sort of reverse engineer the pathophysiology for these people must have been persistent virus because they get better with Paxlovid. Yeah, that's a great question. So at first, I, I think Ziad had one of the best quotes of the last two years, uh, where he said that if you've seen one case of long COVID, you've seen one case of long COVID, and. Um, I think that that really struck a chord with me when I read that, because um, it's totally true. I think, you know, many of us truly believe that there are different phenotypes of long COVID and we're working hard to parse that out right now. The reason that this is important is because each of those phenotypes potentially has a different underlying mechanism. And so treating people with phenotype one that has mechanism A with uh, treatment for mechanism B is not going to result in a positive result. And, and we know from the construct of clinical trials that you really need to include a specific target population of interest. And so by jumbling everything together, you increase the risk of failing to identify something that might really work to help a subgroup of people. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of the efforts um, in recover in the next year are probably going to be around defining these phenotypes and then exploring whether there are specific types of treatments that work for specific phenotypes. Is there, and I think you had published some anecdotal stuff about Paxlovid in, in, in some patients. First, did that play out? And if, if you had COVID and still felt cruddy four months out, let's say very bad fatigue and, and brain fog, and you could take Paxlovid and no one would notice and that you were taking it off the UA criteria, would you do it? Well, so that's also, that's a complicated question. I mean, as you said, you cannot access Paxlovid outside the EUA, although lots of right. people are. Um, so we, we began to see uh, people this spring who had long COVID were able to take Paxlovid later than according to the EUA and swore up and down that they were cured by it. We published the case series of this. Um, my email was flooded by people reaffirming that and telling me that that was correct. And also by people telling me that they did that and it was absolutely not correct. Mm -hmm. So I do not think that there is a known answer to this question. Paxlovid is not without risk. It has many drug interactions, um, can have some pretty bad side effects um, that people don't like. And so you can't really do it without supervision. Um, I really think that taken together, that means that this needs to be a clinical trial and it needs to happen soon. Yeah, 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 thanks. What, what, Michael, what are your thoughts about people who take Paxlovid during the acute phase? You know, people are, sort of, right? Like there's a lot of people who take Paxlovid. So well, what's sort of their risk of long COVID vis-a-vis -vis people who go untreated? Because actually, unfortunately, there are a lot of people who would qualify yeah, for yeah. the EUA, but for some reason or another, I cannot figure it out, they're untreated. So yeah. what are your thoughts about well, that? Yeah, so lots of thoughts on that. So, so there was a lot of hope, just like there was hope when vaccines rolled out that it would totally eliminate long COVID and everybody would just get treated up front. They wouldn't get long COVID done. Um, it, as part of that case series that we published, we actually had one individual who took Paxlovid according to the EUA and subsequently developed long COVID. And so um, I do not think that it will totally eliminate the risk, but you know, it makes sense that if um, if the amount of virus that people have early on matters, that it could potentially decrease the risk. Um, this is one of the questions that we're hoping to investigate now with Link and um, in collaboration with some of the other groups at UCSF. It sounds um, like it's fair, it's fair to say at this moment, the hope that taking packs of it early, that one of it, you know, it's proven benefit in terms of lowering mortality and hospitalization rate, but the hope for, for benefit that it would lower the long COVID risk, that has not been proven. Not proven, but probably won't increase the long COVID risk. So a viable hypothesis to be tested. The viable hypothesis to be tested though, right? It's not proven, yeah. but we don't know. Like, the no, thing don't. that I no, the thing know. that I worry about is what Ziad just said, which is that some, you know, I, I do Paxlovid prescribing for people with acute COVID as part of telemedicine at San Francisco General. And some people tell me that they don't want to take it because they are concerned that they're going to get rebound and get long COVID. And so the the worry that I have is that, you know, again speaking to what Ziad said, is that there's a lot of misinformation or disinformation going around and it makes it really tough for people to make informed decisions without the guidance of, of, of their yeah, provider. Yeah. Well, it's misinformation, disinformation, then anecdote. I, you know, yeah. I tell you, my, my wife took Paxlovid, 
got rebound uh, and has a, a fairly soft version of long COVID, still has, has pretty profound fatigue six months out. And, uh, and that fatigue symptom came really during the rebound phase, not the initial phase. So, you know, I watch that, it makes me wonder. I have no evidence beyond that, but, you know, it, it, it's natural to, to wonder about it. But at this point, sort of an open question. Lakshmi, how do you, I mean, you have these patients in some ways, some of them have disabling symptoms and they're desperate to try something. And you've said that all we know to do is give them symptom relieving therapies. I imagine there must be an inclination to just do some Hail Marys and try some stuff, right? I think I completely understand that desire while we're in this place of a lot of uncertainty and not good therapeutic options. I think like Dr. Palooz just said, I have a number of patients in our clinic who've had a second COVID infection, who've taken Paxlovid, and we see the heterogeneity there. Some have gotten better with it. Some got better temporarily and then kind of returned to their poor baseline. Some got with no difference at all in symptoms. And it, it goes back to that car analogy, right? When you think about what is the underlying biology, if your steering wheel is broken and you're giving it extra brake fluid, it's not going to help. So we really need to target the biology to help the phenotypes, to help the symptoms. And it really needs to go in that order because otherwise we're just kind of throwing things against the wall and we don't really know exactly what we're treating or how. But I completely understand the desperation of patients and families who want anything to get better and there's so much uncertainty and months of living with such a poor quality of life, being unable to work is devastating for people. Yeah. Maybe the last question is, I have to say your, your research has profoundly impacted the way I think about this. And, and because I really do think about trying to avoid COVID, both because of symptomatic persistent symptoms, but also these long-term risks of things that I, you know, just don't, I'm old enough to be at risk for a heart attack or a stroke or a clot or a kidney disease. And the idea of elevating my risk to the level that you, that you're describing is scary. I don't know that your research has sort of gotten through the public consciousness in a way that I would have guessed if you talk about the magnitude of these risk factors for some of the most scary, uh, non-communicable diseases. First of all, do you think that's true? And, 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 and maybe in addition, I, I think maybe one of the reasons is people look at the research and wonder if it's real. Like, are there confounders here? Does someone have COVID? Are they plugged into the medical system? So we just find their MI earlier or something else that, that explains it as opposed to being real. So first of all, answer the sort of epi confounding question. And then maybe you can end with, uh, are people paying enough attention to this? So, I mean, we, I mean, these are by nature sort of a, a observational work. So this is not a randomized experiment. And the tragedy here is that we will never be able to randomize people to COVID versus no COVID. That would not be ethical. So I think that the best we could do is try to, to do, you know, the, the really apply the most rigorous, you know, causal inference approaches to try to elevate our confidence that what we're seeing is really a true and a cause and effect, not really due to confounding. And our experience sort of a, doing a lot of negative controls and applying as much scrutiny as we can, and also reproducibility by other groups, both in the US and in and, and, and Europe and, and elsewhere, sort of elevates the confidence that this is really this this is really there. Uh, so why has it not really? I, mean, I think I, mean, I, I don't know. Maybe I live in a little bit of a bubble, but in my bubble, there is a lot of recognition about this. Um, I, I, I think there is a there is a lot of interest in the, in the you know pr from the public and 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 the media about this. I think I think it's a, a but, but for a lot of like the. the Maybe it's hard to connect the dots, hard to connect sort of the idea that, a, that an infection can result in long-term risk of non-communicable disease. And I think that's actually partly because we ignored that post-viral condition for 100 years. I mean, we really had an opportunity to really study it for the past 100 years, but we decided to sort of sweep it under the rug after the, you know, the flu pandemic in the early days of the early decades of the 20th century. And now we're paying the price by like, oh, we're rediscovering things that should have been done, you know, 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. But I think the hope, the silver lining is that if we apply at enough attention to it now and address it and understand it now, that will pay dividends now, but also hopefully we'll be, we'll be better prepared for future pandemics, which, which almost a certainty. We're going to have future pandemics and, and, and viruses do produce long-term manifestations. That's, that's very, very clear. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably part of what's going on. I think also... You know, as your research began to come out, it was at a time where people were ready to be done with COVID or beginning to be. And so as the evidence, the acute threat was falling and that largely because of vaccines and boosters and to some extent Paxlovid, the idea that you have to embrace yet another long term threat was just 
too scary. <laughs> I think there's some active avoidance there just because the implications are really so profound. Uh, any final comments, Lakshmi or Michael, you want to make? I would just say for anyone who's li still listening, it's not too late to get vaccinated. It is still not too late. That is still something we can do to avoid long COVID. Um, and I, I would say watch this space. You know, there's a lot of advocacy from patient groups, from clinicians, from researchers, from all of us. We're advocating at the state level and the national level for more research, more centers of excellence, more coordination to learn lessons for now and for future. Great. Michael, anything else you want to add? Yeah, I know, I, I know that it can feel like it's slow going um, and that a lot of progress is not being made quickly, but there are a lot of uh, really smart and dedicated people that are working really hard to figure this out. And I am more hopeful now in 2022 than I've been at any other point in the pandemic that we will begin to get answers to this and really begin um, to roll out treatment opportunities for people. Great. And just to sort of emphasize something you've all emphasized, you can't get long COVID if you don't get COVID. And so as you make your decisions about not only vaccination and boosting, but how careful to be in certain circumstances, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it is reasonable to be letting down our guard a little bit. The case rates are very low right now, but they're going to go back up. And keeping all of this in mind as you think about your behavioral decisions is really important. Uh, let me thank the three of you for absolutely a terrific cutting edge discussion about a really important and complicated issue. Thank you for the work you're doing in helping us understand this better and uh, everybody stay safe out there. Thank you all so much.